So now we begin, all of us, together, pastors, staff, leaders, worshipers, children, Sunday school people, confirmation, youth group, everybody in this place. We are united by a powerful gift that we share. We're calling it hope. You know, one of the ancient pictures of the Christian church is that of a voyage. So we're all getting on board a ship called Hope. It's going to take us to a place called Hope. We're setting sail across the seas of life together until we get to the shore. And uh, we want to make sure we take with us the primary help that anchors us. We just heard it read in the scripture. Hope is what? Anchor of the soul. That love phrase, don't you? The anchor of the soul means it anchors your life. The hope that we share in Christ, risen, ascended, living, ruling, the hope we have in Christ, in our living God, this is the thing that holds us strong and secure, those readings said. So, do you think that uh, the world is in need of a little more hope these days? It's amazing. I think that there's a sort of a ways of uh, despair, darkness, worry, fear that's sort of going into every place, whether from schools to churches to uh, certainly to governments and, and everywhere. People are struggling against the spirit of hopelessness. Now, I'm going to import a slide here that I used back in Easter. Some of you might remember this as I talk about primary causes for hopelessness. In I read last week that 40,000 people in our country died by their own hand last year. 70,000 people died because of opiates, overdoses. So opioids have become part of the problem, not just the health of people in being. So what is it that is driving all of that? But there are a lot of reasons that can come up. Sometimes people, because they feel so utterly alone, to by themselves, they're going to do it all, it's all up to me, and it gets uh, rather desperate in their mind. Or sometimes you get things that happen that strike you or your family and put you into a whole world in a spin of uh, challenge and, and tumult. And so you try to figure out, how huh, is this bigger than life? It's bigger than me. Or you suffer a big loss family in your life, you know that it's a long voyage through that grief process. Sometimes people get stuck along the way. And then there's this possibility that we'll mess up really bad. And <laughs> we do something that really is against our core value as Christian people. And then we feel so ashamed. And sometimes people get stuck carrying this heavy guilt and it's depressing to walk around with. Or you try something, you had a dream, or you wanted to do this, and it's failing, or it's not working, or you get defeated in the game, or whatnot. People sometimes can really be dragged down in their spirit by defeat. One of the worst is if somebody you love and trust stabs you in the back, and you get hurt, or you get betrayed by someone, and you don't know how to process that. You can get stuck in the resentment and the pain of it. Or if you're living day to day, scrapping for bread, and you're up against, you know, impoverishment of life, trying to survive, when that's relentless, it's happening day in, day out, often it's in our cities, then it can bring a whole cloud of dark despair over your life. And then, if you just feel stuck, trapped, in a problem, and you don't see a way out at all, then that can certainly drag the spirit down. All of it is hopelessness, what we would call it. Underneath it, theologically, there's a deeper issue that I want to talk about this again. And that is we, we often, and we do the best we can to find stability in life through all those changes, to anchor ourselves in different ways by good things. So any one of these kind of things, like you have a good job, or you go to work, you go to school, and you follow the routine that you're back in that as a family, or maybe your investments help 
John to give you a sense of security or insurance. Or you got a good friend or maybe to stabilize you. Maybe you fall in love. Maybe it has something to do with you got good health. You can hang on to that for your family. These are things that are all good. But as anchors for life, I'm here to tell you they're too small. They're too small to face the two mobs of hurricanes and issues of life, the biggest issues that cause us deeper anxiety and hopelessness. We need something a lot bigger. So we have this promise that we're going to be exploring together over these 12 weeks. And it looks like this. Why don't you read it with me? Second Peter. God, God has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them so God has given us what kind of promises? Great. Great. That word really means great big. Giant, ginormous, huge promises. They're huge and majestic. And the kind of promises the word of the Lord brings, they can provide an anchor you can't find anywhere else in your life or in the world. And they're so big, it says, notice what, what happens when you're anchored in this hope. It says, you participate in what? In the divine nature. You know what that's saying? That's saying you become part of God. The Lord God, creator of the universe, redeemer of us all, then becomes part of you. That's giant, that's huge. It's the kind of thing that can hold us fast. Life is dealing us a lot of challenges today. So we need a big anchor. There are ships out there that are huge. And they require giant uh, anchors like this one you're looking at. And uh, the chains are heavy. This isn't a picture of the biggest anchor in the world, but it's a pretty big one. If you saw the biggest anchor, the chains would make that figure kind of look like a little Lego guy. It's, they're like 500 pounds each, just a chain length. And it chains you up to an anchor that weighs, what do you think? A ton, five tons, 20 tons. How about 75 tons? I mean, that's like dropping a building down into the ocean to hold that anchor, that ocean anchor. That's, that's a huge kind of hope. That's the kind of hope that we get in Christ. A Job through the Bible is known as a guy that suffered greatly. That his sea was not only choppy, it was devastating, hurricane-like. He lost everything. And yet, he found himself grounded. Let's read this together, Job and David. Those who forget God lose their hope. Because they lose, it's like cutting your anchor. So, how do we anchor ourselves in the mind? What does an anchor do for a boat? Well, if you're uh, in the bay, it holds you right there. Right? So you don't drift. Then our anchor in Christ does a similar thing. If you cut an anchor at a, at a boat in a bay, what's going to happen? It's going to be moved by just the natural flow of the waves and that's the storm. It'll just gradually be taken from where you wanted to park it, you know, somewhere else, who knows where. And that can happen in a Christian journey. We want our own voyage. A lot of times, I see for Christian people, it's not some big thing that took them away from their faith community. It's often sort of gradually just drifting, life's normal, busyness, stuff that happens, just kind of moves you away. And pretty soon you find yourself, oh, I'm not praying anymore. Or I'm not talking to God anymore. I'm not thinking God talks anymore. And that's what happens if you don't have the anchor to hold you in the community. The other thing that the anchor does, as we talked about, is it holds you fast, holds you safe, holds you secure. So when the inevitable challenges of stormy times in life come, 
you can still hang on and stay, but stay out. So what we're saying is the strongest thing that we can anchor our hope to are the promises of God. God said, and the whole universe exploded into being. God says something, and something is going to happen. That's amazing. So through the record of history, we have all kinds of people who were given promises. We can talk about Abraham and Sarah. Not a promise. They got the children, stars in the sky, and so forth. You can do the, the biblical story. It's just a record of people being called to anchor their hope in the word and the promise of God. God has many of them for us that he tells us. God says, I made you. And I made you in my image. I gave you life and breath. That's a promise that you have the image of God inside of you. God says, I will never let you be tested beyond my ability to help. And so just at the right time, I'll open the door for you for this case. God says, your sins are forgiven. Every single one of them always are covered with my grace. That happens every single day as persons are new. That's a promise from God. God says, I am the resurrection of the life. And whoever believes in me will never die. That's a huge promise. Now here's the thing. Pastor Karen and I probably both have this in common. The people sometimes ask us fascinating theological questions, especially kids. You know, confirmation studies. So, like, can God, can God make a rock bigger than God can lift? <laughs> you know, like that. Is there anything that God can't do? Well, that's Pastor Karen. <laughs> But there are some things that even God can do. God cannot do an evil thing and still be the God that we worship. And God cannot be false. We heard in scripture that it's impossible for God to lie. So if you believe that, then the promises of God are things you can take to the bank. You can bank on that he'll never leave you or forsake you. You can bank on his promise to be with you always, his promise to help. You can bank on the power of the resurrection to <coughs> keep your life in everlasting, everlasting Christ. These are anchors. This is the anchor that we all really need. And it isn't just biblical people who anchor their lives in this kind of hope, is it? It's you. It's me. As we trust in Christ, right? So how many of you saw John the King's funeral, by the way, John? An amazing funeral on a Saturday morning. One of the things I read about Cain is when he was a POW in Vietnam, that he was elected to be the chaplain, you know, for all the prisoners. He didn't want to do it, but they elected him as this. And he didn't have a lot, and they wouldn't give him a Bible or anything like that. But when they could meet together in his yard, then they would do some kind of faith things. And he said he had a few scriptures, maybe like Psalm 23, but he had the Apostles' Creed memorized and the Nicene Creed memorized. Yeah, so he used those you know, line by the line to speak the word of God to people. That was the anchor for him and for the others. There are many others I don't know along the way, like Harold. Harold was an interesting guy. He, he was a bachelor all his life. But when I met him, he told me, you know, I'm going to get married. <laughs> uh, he had this strong sense that God was going to have, have to enjoy a marriage. Uh, um, but, you know, it wasn't happening. So he got into his 70s and at some point, not so I'm a year old, you know, he said, you know, the other thing, he's old. Oh, yes, yes, I'm going to get married. And so he went on and on as a bachelor until he got to his 80s. And then he might have to go to North Nursing Home. And uh, so he was there, and I didn't talk about this anymore, but suddenly after three months there, he calls me up and says, Pastor Frank, you've got to come over right away today. I want you to meet my fiance. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. 
So I was over there, and he was so excited, he fell in love with somebody way out the hall, and she to him. And so they, they decided to get hit. And uh, he's so excited, we're walking down the hallway together to go meet her, and he's holding on the railing. And I'm next to him talking about marriage and gifts and all of this kind of stuff, and then I realized I'm talking to myself. He's not there anymore. <laughs> and I looked around, there he is, like on the floor. He did it. The nurse teams. No, oh, he's getting so excited he's fainting. <laughs> <laughs> we had a wonderful wedding. These two older people. I think we had them still. And uh, guess what? If God puts the promises and dream in your heart, don't let anybody talk about it. Not even your pastor. That's terrible. Or what about Erna? When I first met Erna, I was in my 20s, and uh, I mean, she was a sassy woman in the like, mid-50s or so. She invited me to her house for coffee, and she wanted to talk about some serious stuff, like the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I thought, well, oh, gosh, I could be able to study the Dead Sea Scrolls a bit before I go over there. And she always wanted to talk about deep theological things, because it's such fun talking about all that. Years. But when Erna became Asian, Something weird happened to her, which probably a very person knows. She went into a nursing home and she couldn't stop talking. So it was like this constant flow of doing like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to remember this kind of thing, I'm going to do this, non stop chat kind of thing. So when I would go see her, I would ignore that and just talk to her about memories. And I would roll her out into this little side room and then we would have you know, a little worship in there. And so, when the time came, I would open up my little black communion box. And as I started doing that, her eyes would white, and she would start whispering more. She still talked, but it was getting quiet. And then when I get to the time to say, you know, and then he took the bread, she sighed. When I finished, then, and he taught us to pray. And she said, oh, oh, who are you? How would you let him be? Perfect. Amen. <laughs> I get like crazy, but what was that? A simple thing. It's not that complicated. The Lord's Prayer anchored her to the real anchor of hope, which is Jesus Christ. The kind of thing stays with the person. Or how about Martha? I didn't know Martha, but I met her in the ICU because I visited somebody in the family out in the hallway talking with my Bible and said, Father. Could you please stop and help us? And then go over to the room and what's the problem with child? Yes, she tells me there's someone in ICU that's really in the jam. Looks like it's not going to make it, but we can go on the trade. Absolutely, sure. So I went in by myself, and uh, there's Martha, and she's all the job. And then, uh, the nurse was talking, are you the pastor? Yeah, well, you got to tell this family that she's not going to be here in the morning. You know, they're going to be getting their hopes up about this, that, and everything. I just said, well, okay, thanks for telling me that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so uh, I get the family to come in, and he leaves, and then I go, well, so what would you like to pray for? We want you to pray for a miracle. We know it's not something very good at all, but we you just pray to restore our mother. Well, sure. So, then I started praying, you know, Lord God, you are watching over our lives, and it's all in your hands, and it's all up to you. And uh, we ask the Lord, in your mercy, if there's something, that you would put a hand of, of blessing and life and restore Martha to us. And if not, give us the grace and trust in your future heart. Oh, like that. And uh, honestly, when I walked out of that space and went down the hall, I'm kind of with the nurse. <laughs> I don't think she's going to make it to the night. The next day, I come over in the afternoon, expecting to find an empty bed. And guess what? There's Martha sitting up, and she's spotted with her family. <laughs> don't think. What was that? Ask Dr. Sharon. I don't know what it is. <laughs> it's the mighty grace of God. So never stop praying. Never give up hope on anybody. Yeah, it is up to God. It is God's 